good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, the Three Ring Circus, the Washington Conservation Guild. Tonight's, uh, this session is three speeches, three presentations. Uh, the session is titled Tools and Materials. And we've got a couple of wonderful presentations on diverse topics. Our first speaker is going to be Ariana Johnston. Um, Ariana is a conservator at the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Laboratory. Uh, she serves as the website administrator of the Washington Conservation Guild, and she finished her, after finishing terms as virtual meeting director and intern coordinator. She has a Master of Science in Conservation Practice from Cardiff University in the United Kingdom, and originally from Bloomington, Indiana. Great. Hello, and thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's good to speak to you all today. So I'm gonna start off by saying that I am not a botanist. Uh, I will do my best to answer any questions about plants, but my knowledge is limited, I'm a conservator. I'm gonna talk in generalities uh, because it gets complicated quickly. Um, first, I'll explain why I'm thinking about thorns at all. Uh, next, I will explain where I've used them in the past in conservation. Um, next, I'll offer some criteria for selecting thorny plants, and I'll give a few options that can be found locally, uh, plus some tips on harvesting and preparing them for use in the lab. Uh, and then I'll show a couple of case studies and finally give a few thorny options that I haven't worked with, but may work better for others. <clears throat> so uh, I was first introduced to the idea of using thorns in the conservation lab while I was a student intern at the uh, Staffordshire Hoard in Birmingham, England. Um, the hoard consisted of 17, or sorry, 7th and 8th century gold filigree and garnet cloisonne set in gold, which is featured here. Um, the scale on the left is millimeters, so the filigree was extremely fine, and um, all the artifacts were thoroughly compacted with soil. So while I was there, uh, the goal was to remove soil from every crevice um, without disturbing the microscopic details or unseating the garnets that were um, very meticulously set in every single uh, cell. <clears throat> and um, there was research interest in how these were made, so adding new scratches would uh, be disruptive to that. Uh, thorns were really the only tool that worked for this collection. Um, everything else was too large or would split or would be too uh, hard um, and would scratch. So the lab stock was collected from one of the conservators' back garden hedges and included barberry, uh, pyracanthus, hawthorn, and blackthorn, <clears throat> all of which are very common in the UK uh, as hedge, um, thorny hedge dividers, but uh, aren't as common in the US. Um, each species had different working properties, and even within a single type, there was a range of size, shape, and texture. So this ingenuity and finding and making your own tools really stuck with me as an intern. And I've wished for a supply of thorns since moving back to the US. <clears throat> in my mind, they serve a unique purpose in my conservation toolkit that nothing can replicate. And some of the advantages I've listed here um, I had no idea which American plants could serve the same purpose, and until recently, I did not have access to a garden or a legal place to forage. Um, the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Lab sits within Jefferson Patterson Park, and uh, when I got my new job, <laughs> I was very excited uh, because there are 560 wildflower meadows, forested trails, and wetland shores along the Patuxent River, which is just an, over an hour south of DC. Please come and visit. Um, one of the park's most important resources, though, is our horticulturalist, Lindsay Hollister, um, who is all about responsible land management and is very supportive of foraging on the park, and always lets us know when the wine berries and pawpaws are in season. Mm -hmm. Um, so here are my criteria for selecting thorns for use in the lab. First, I decided to limit myself to what was available within the park grounds, since we have permission to forage here. Um, there are options I'll mention later that might grow somewhere else, but uh, and locally, but uh, we don't have access to them. Second, I didn't want to encourage or expect myself to wander off the trail, and I didn't want to stumble into poison ivy. So anything within trail's reach or the field edge uh, was important to me. 
Third, I wanted something that was abundant or even invasive that I could help to clear from the landscape because Lindsay has a lot of work to do. <laughs> she has a lot of volunteers, but uh, I wanted to help. And I didn't want to accidentally kill off something that was rare or important for the park. And last, I was looking for thorns that were generally needle shaped that could fit into a pin vise, which is what I used during my work with the horde. Uh, my favorite thorn that I used as an intern was a hawthorn, which is about two to three inches long and could easily be mounted in the pin vise or modified as needed. Um, a straight tapered shape uh, rather than a hook shape like a rose thorn would be better for work in the lab. So uh, with Lindsay's help, we came up with some options. And the first I'll mention is greenbrier or smilax. Um, there are several species in the area that are native to the area, uh, but the greenbrier most found at the park grows as a long trailing vine that clusters into thickets, which you can see on the left. Um, it also likes to spread out into the trail or roadways. And since it has thorns on it, it is not pleasant to run into. So I don't mind cutting it back to the edge of the trail. Uh, this is what the thorns look like. Uh, the leaves are glossy and round, and the thorns have black or brown tips. <clears throat> uh, the other option we found uh, is black locust, which is a fast-growing tree that seeks out the sun and grows in disturbed areas. Um, thorns are common on new growth, but as the branches age, the thorns tend to disappear. Um, this is what the thorns look like. Um, at the park, they are common around field edges, and new branches often reach out for the sun, but they get in the way of our riding mowers. So this is actually a really good example of a black locust because this is a black locust tree. Uh, this is a black locust tree. There's something back here, too. And then this is a black locust tree. And then also here are these little saplings that are also trying to find sun. So all of this new growth would probably have a lot of thorns on it, there would be some newer branches that would have, uh, this is a pretty young tree, so a right place for harvesting. <clears throat> uh, so when it comes to harvesting, uh, these are the tools I found were pretty basic, but uh, important. So proper pruning shears, I brought mine from home, my garden shears, um, they're sharp and I know where they've been. Um, and uh, it's best to follow best pruning practice. So cut back to the back of the branches where it intersects with the next branch or the previous branch. Uh, and then gardening gloves and bringing a bag because you don't want to carry around a sharp stick for more than five minutes and um, ask me how I know. <laughs> so, uh, and then some of this research is still in progress. I had a busier fall than I expected. So um, I'm not sure what a quarantine, your quarantine period would look like, um, how long, might you expect, can I cut off the leaves and then I know that there's no insects that are growing off of, or that are that are coming off of the things that I brought into the lab? Um, or do we need a freezing procedure? Our freezer is down, but maybe we can use the freeze dryer, which I know isn't practical for everybody, but maybe we can use the, floor, uh, the oven because um, they also need to dry. So the, har the harvested thorns are kind of soft and flexible, <clears throat> but still retain a lot of uh, moisture within the, the structure of the uh, the thorn. So drying hardens them and makes them really more usable. Uh, so how long does drying take? I don't know. Uh, I forgot about my branches and they dried. So, <laughs> um, and uh, can I speed this up, for example, in the oven and then take care of those at the same time? So uh, I will be presenting this research in May uh, at AIC in a poster session. So come and see me or contact me in summer and I should have a better idea. So uh, for using them, once the thorns are dry, then um, I've been using a pin vice mount. So this is a good example of one that we like one we have. I brought mine with me. Um, so it has, this one has multiple collets. So you unscrew that, this tip, and then there are multiple collets that like slide in and out and you can uh, have different apertures for different size thorns because sometimes they're really wide, they have a really wide base and sometimes they're finer depending on what you need. So um, many of these come with only one collet, but I recommend the multiple collets because it's more usable. Um, and then here's some case studies. So the first is a, a 19th century copper aloe spur. Unfortunately, I don't get to see any 7th or 8th century gold 
incarnate filigree and <laughs> cloisonne anymore. So uh, this has been really helpful. And we don't really see a lot of gold and or gilt surfaces in archaeological conservation. So we, we sometimes do, but uh, I haven't seen them yet. So uh, this is a spur. So as you can see over here, there's this like white kind of waxy uh, surface that or um, accretions that were on on the surface. And most importantly, they were in the pitted surface texture and nothing else that I had with me could work. So this is a micrograph of, this is the black locust thorn. And you can see how sharp that tip is and it can actually get into some of those pits. Um, a porcupine quill, even a new one wasn't gonna fit. Um, and many of these had really rough surfaces at the bottom underneath that white waxy, probably polishing compound. So um, using a scalpel would have meant that I would have scratched the bottom and then that would have been very, not very pretty. So this is me working under the microscope on the spur. And I forgot an after treatment photo, but it looked great. Um, so <laughs> it worked. So that was the important thing. Uh, this is the, um, the, this is a more recent uh, something. This is a during treatment. So this is a two part button with a button cover that is really decorated with some really nice open work. So those are, all of these are um, holes that are cut, pierced uh, through the copper that is has a really beautiful cast design. And all of this, um, it was really, really hard to fit into okay. the, the piercing uh, with anything else. So I did try to use a porcupine quill, but it was a little too flexible. So Thorn was really handy. This also, I didn't include a picture, but also was open on the side. So it's two part button. So it's kind of a clamshell. So I was able to use the thorn use one of my longer thorns and kind of like sweep out any soil that was remaining inside uh, the two-part button. So I think that came out nice. And I'll talk about a few other options here um, that are in the area. So pyracantha is fire, also known as fire thorn and berberis also known as barberry. Uh, so both of these are labeled as invasive um, in the area. So both Arlington County and Maryland considers them invasive, which means that they're here. They're, they're already here. So um, so you shouldn't plant more, but if you happen to find them, then go ahead and cut them a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so they're often used for ornamental planting. Uh, Pyrocantha has a really gorgeous like orange and red um, berries that happen in the fall and winter. And then Barberry has, is a really nice red uh, thorny bush. So it's often used in parking lots and like near the sign of a church or a you know shopping center, um, you see them everywhere. And if you would like locations of Barberry in Northern Virginia, let me know. I'm not going to mention them because I'm being recorded, but I know where they are. So, um, also hawthorn. I know that I have seen hawthorn in the Midwest. Um, I've seen it. The they used to be used as needles, hypothetically, in um, in colonial times. So. Um, they're, if anyone has a hawthorn in their backyard and they're, they want to donate to science, let me know, then I'll come over and help you harvest thorns. Um, it's also the state flower of Missouri, so it is native relative to, uh, the U.S. And this is a different hawthorn than the U.K. one. The U.K. one is a shrub, this is a tree, so. Um, and then also the devil's walking stick was another one that Lindsay had mentioned as an option, but um, it's native, which is good. And it is at the park, but a lot of them are um, in the shrub forest undergrowth. So I don't want to go tromping around off trail. And also the thorns grow on the trunk. So that means I would have to kind of harvest the whole thing or individually harvest thorns, which sounds terrible in the field. So I don't want to do that. <laughs> Um, thanks. Thank you to everybody at MacLab and uh, also including Lindsay Hollister and the Staffordshire Horde team for their ingenuity. That's it. Any questions? We've got several minutes for questions. So if anybody has any questions for Ariane. Everyone, uh, thank you. That was, that was great. Um, I'm intrigued by this idea that they're really sharp but they don't scratch the surface. So just anecdotally, is this because there's like a little bit of bend to the thorn or does it break or what have you noticed? So working, especially with the copper alloy, I have not 
I have not scratched using the black locust thorn yet. I haven't been able to use a green briar thorn yet. Um, I haven't found the right object that needed thorns after I had harvested them. Um, so yes, I have not scratched. I think you could if you're really pressed, but it does break. Um, but it, the nice thing is that, like, unlike a sharpened or a worked like bamboo skewer or a wooden skewer, it doesn't split. Mm -hmm. So it is really nice that you can have that really fine point and then and press uh, hard. But for the most part, it's good for removing, or I've been using it for removing softer corrosion or softer soil or materials. I also found it was useful for like, this is very specific to my job, but cleaning wet leather shoes. There's lacing holes on the side. And so uh, it was really nice to use the thorn because I wasn't, I could have punched through the leather probably because it's wet and really fragile, but uh, it was really nice to kind of clear those out without um, scratching the surface, yeah. Mm -hmm. Once they're dry, are they absorbent? Like can you deliver silver? No, but I did use it as a swab holder once. I think, especially for that button, because I wanted to not only, you kind of have to loosen things and then clear it away with a brush or a swab, um, depending on what you're clearing. So I did add cotton to the end. So, but, and I didn't feel, feel like it got soggy or had behaved differently, but it probably does take up solvent or water in some, because like, it's plant material. <laughs> Are the two samples that you harvested are they at all sappy? Is that no, no, I haven't, haven't. Uh, ha I do have uh, samples if I if any would like at the end. Um, but no, I haven't found any any like resin or residues that have transferred. Yeah, um, in archaeological conservation, that's kind of <laughs> my bread and butter, but. Uh, yeah, and even at the even at the Staffordshire board, it was mostly that was that was literally found in a potato field. So it was like a very fertile soil that was compact really into the into the surfaces. But, but yeah, soft, softer things. Um, so it's not going to clean iron corrosion off of something, unfortunately. So we should be driving for do you, do you let them get to a different institute having to do doing something, or do you kind of like go up? No, I've just been going for dry. Uh, but I like that idea, although it's still they're still flexible when they're once they're dry. I mean, they I don't think you could fall. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I left it. I would guess. I left it probably for a month before I looked at it again, and they were pretty much dry. Yeah, but I I hope to track that better on my next harvest. I also want to figure out what time of year is best to harvest because maybe winter they're already dry, and so I don't have to. And there's fewer insects, maybe microbes, but you know. Um, but yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next speaker is Christy Wright who is principal of Wright Conservation and Framing in Front Royal, Virginia. Thank you very much for driving in from Front Royal tonight to present to us. Uh, she specializes in book and paper conservation. She has specialized in the leather discussion group since its inception and worked on the development of this database that she'll be presenting on as a contract conservator for the National Library of Medicine, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. Christy. Thank you, Howard, and thank you everyone for coming to our talk today. I am Christy Wright, and as you see tonight, I will be introducing you to a georeferenced leather database developed by the Leather Discussion Group, which is intended to allow worldwide users to collaborate in building a global repository for leather research techniques and trends. The database will be publicly accessible. So during and after this talk, I encourage you to think about how you might be able to contribute your own leather research. The Leather Discussion Group, or LDG, was formed initially in 2016 by four book conservators, Katie Wagner, Holly Hero, Bill Mentor, and me, to explore the various effects of leather dyes. After delving into dyes briefly, many questions arose, and the project quickly shifted into an exploration of the life cycle of leather itself. 
This multifaceted approach has led to the exploration of many topics in consultation with experts across the world. You can find further details about the other aspects of our work at the upcoming AIC annual meeting in Salt Lake City, so I won't go into further detail here. The idea to create a database of this sort was presented by Holly, who saw a unique opportunity to use, utilize the database development skills present at the National Library of Medicine to create a repository for leather research. The goal of this database is to take a holistic approach to what is known about leather in a variety of settings. A lot of research has been done from multiple perspectives, such as manufacturing, conservation, and consumer use, resulting in a large body of knowledge. Previous research, regulations, and consumer demands have driven changes in the leather production process. Previous research projects have resulted in copious amounts of research in niche areas. Leather workers have persisted in um, Leather workers have persisted with traditions passed down over generations of training. Collection caretakers have tinkered with dressing and a plethora of treatments abound. Meanwhile, cultural, environmental, and agricultural trends have shifted, resulting in different approaches to creating leather. We would like to keep track of all of those things and more here. And throughout it all, location appears to play a significant role in practices, both historically and currently. Thus, the georeference part of the title, we aim to gather GPS coordinates in, in the database. Coalescing the data in an accessible way is the primary goal of the database. And so it is our hope that doing so will be a launching point for further study and analysis. Contractors and staff in the National Library of Medicine, History of Medicine Division, and Office of Computer and Communication Services Branch, or HMD and OSIS for short, built the database. HMD contractors and staff provided concept guidance, while OSIS contractors and staff programmed the database using, using Python Django, an open source high-level web framework that encourages rapid development and clean pragmatic design. For security reasons, NLM could not host the database and allow it to be public facing. Therefore, the decision was made to find an outside institution to host it. The ability for the database to be public facing is integral to the intention behind creating it, as the goal is for users worldwide to contribute data. Dr. Laura Wyrick at the Penn State University Department of Anthropology volunteered to host the database. Dr. Wyrick will also be adding information to the database in the future, as she is participating in an experimental tanning project with our group. Look for more information on that too at the AIC annual meeting this year. Creating the database is truly a collaborative effort, drawing on expertise in a variety of areas. The database development was recently completed, and the source code transferred to Penn State in December, so the live version will hopefully be available very soon. Stay tuned for more information, which we will post on the AIC Leather Research Wiki. Upon logging into the database, users will see a toolbar with a series of menu options. Each heading has a drop-down list, with links to forms for viewing an entry. The menu headings are people and items, environmental and cultural factors, leather and tanning, treatments, testing, and about. A few forms are listed under more than one heading. Clicking on a form will take the user to a page with a list of entries present in that category. Users can either view existing entries or create a new one from this area. All of the forms are designed for manual entry. User-friendly options shown on the right, such as text entry, check boxes, drop-down forms, and radio buttons are present. In most forms, only one or two fields are actually required. This is by design, as we expect that there will be entries with only limited data available. We'd like to gather even that limited data in hopes that, in aggregate, the data will start to show trends we might not otherwise see. Viewing records brings up a slightly different display option shown on the left. In order to protect the integrity of the data, users can only edit entries they created, but they can view any record. The first column is people and items. This has four forms, creator, leather supplier, object, and sample information. The creator form will include information on leather workers, both historic and present day. Geographic locations, training locations, associated collections, objects, and institutions can be entered here, along with preferred leather types, water sources, and a plethora of other information. Many forms link to data and other forms. For example, if the creator has a preferred leather supplier, 
This can be selected from a dropdown auto populated from existing leather supplier entries. If the desired supplier is not listed, the user can create an entry for it using a convenient button built into the database design. While I'll mention some of these cross references in the coming slides, for the sake of expediency, I'm sure you'll understand this is a brief overview, so I can't list everything. Leather supplier includes information on vendors and tanners who supply leather to creators. Again, this will include both present day and historic suppliers. Multiple locations can be entered in order to account for business moves and additional business locations. The object forum is intended to focus on individual items. Among other things, the condition of the item can be stored along with its provenance, treatments done, and leather used. The sample information forum stores information on samples used in research. It links out to many other forums such as object, leather supplier, individual testing forums, and research projects. The second column, environmental and cultural factors, has five forms, influential historic events, water sources, pollution, pesticides, and research projects. Influential historic events is intended to track things that might have impacted leather use and production historically. For example, guild regulations or immigration could play a role in local practices. Water quality may also influence leather longevity, whether in the manufacturing process or in the leather working process. Especially as both production and working with leather is in some ways a wet process, we felt it important to include this form. In several research studies, pollution has been shown to impact leather longevity, so we included a way to enter available pollution data for specific locations. Research projects, whether modern or historic, can be summarized in this form. They can be linked to associated individuals, objects, samples, and tests, among other things. The leather and tanning column has six forms, which all focus on the leather production process. The leather form is intended to record details about the finished skin, whether on or off an object. As one of the central forms in the database, this one is linkable to many of the other forms, including the other forms in this column. Animal type focuses on the basic common and scientific classification of the animal from which a hide is obtained. For example, both taurus or cow. Animal breed, meanwhile, allows the user to input further information regarding the specific animal breed, such as a Jersey cow, and details specific to that breed. Since the leather industry uses hides that are a byproduct of other industries, such as meat or dairy, and selective breeding has influenced many physical traits in modern day animal breeds, this may play a role in things, including diet, hide thickness, fat distribution, and ultimately leather longevity. The tanning methods form is a place to record the multitude of changes in the tanning process throughout history, including process step, current usage, and associated locations. Storing information on the tannins themselves is also important, so we've included a form for their common names, scientific names, chemical makeup, and other things. Dyes, whether used in the manufacturing or leatherworking process, may be entered in the final form in this column. As with most of the other forms, the geographic location of the dye origination and distribution can be entered, allowing users to track their movement through trade, globalization, or cultivation or synthesis in new areas. Treatments includes two forms, consolidations and dyes. Consolidation methods can be entered here, both historic and modern. This is also a place for including treatments such as leather dressing or oiling. The aforementioned dye form is also included in this column as we felt it should be easily accessible from both the treatment and leather columns. Many other treatment details, such as whether a book is covered wet or dry, are available in other spots, so we did not include a separate form for that here at this time. There are a multitude of testing of methods available for leather analysis. While we recognize that many of the methods require a great deal of expertise to accurately interpret, we wanted to have a place for that interpretation here. Most of the test forms here ask for information, such as what type of testing was done, when it was done, what equipment was used, and what the results were. The dedicated forms also include relevant information related to the specific test type. There is also a spot for uploading files if a user would like to include more, include more detail or even raw test results. 
As mentioned previously, the required elements of most forms are minimal, and this is in part intended to allow for flexibility when considering whether to submit research results and methodology. While we believe that any data that can be shared will contribute to a more robust data set that allows for better interpretation, we also recognize that research is ongoing and some of the data may not be ready for sharing in a public database. The other form is intended to allow for any tests that may be done now or in the future, which do not have a dedicated form. Again, file uploads are possible to allow for flexibility. Templates for each form are available for download. Users can add data to the template for batch upload by one of the database administrators. Administrators must be involved in this step as one of the security mechanisms intended to protect the integrity of data as entered. While it is available for use by any participant, we anticipate that this feature will be most useful to institutions, researchers, and others with already large data sets. Data can be exported in CSV or Excel formats. Users can choose to export only select tables if desired. We hope that by allowing users to export data for analysis, the data gathered can transcend iterations of analysis techniques and software. Once enough data is collected, we anticipate that it might lend itself well to multivariate statistical approaches, such as principal component analysis and similar analytical methods. Here are some sample visualizations created in Microsoft Power BI using test data. While we expect the results to be more informative once the database is live and data from multiple sources is available, we think it is impactful to see the ways in which leather data can be visualized even with small data sets. Exporting data allows users to ask questions such as, is there a correlation between animal type and dye color? Or does a consolidation method affect current leather condition? and explore the data in a visual way. Anyone who works with leather or leather objects can participate. Registration is simple and can be done with any email address. Once approved by the database admins, users can view, download, and enter data. We encourage individuals as well as organizations to participate. For example, if a bookbinder covers a book in a particular leather, he can enter that information in the database along with any other pertinent information, such as what type of water he uses, whether the book is stored in a collection, what type of leather was chosen, and which adhesives were used. Likewise, if an object's conservator encounters a leather-covered chair, she can enter the condition of the leather, any treatment that was done, whether previous or current, any testing done, and many other types of information. Or, are you aware of an interesting leather treatment that historically took place at your institution? Perhaps you are well versed in the history of a particular leather worker or tanner. We want to keep track of that too. We encourage users to input only that information which is actually known and which is suitable for inclusion in a public database. Many thanks to the people and institutions who worked on or supported the development or hosting of this database. Thank you to the Washington Conservation Guild for hosting this event and including my presentation. And thanks in advance to the people who contribute, contribute to the database in the future. Finally, thank you for your time. Now, are there any questions? And that's a link to the AIC Leather Research Wiki page where the link to the database will be one day. <laughs> I think it's great, and um, of course, we found that the beginning of figuring out how, how all this works. And one of the things that I've been really trying to do this in a minor scale and it's really for the word for it is the scripting is a thing. Yes. How can you include something about that thing? It's what do you think about including that in one of the Um. Do you, mean, do you mean from like a data integrity standpoint or from just the fact that we only know certain things about certain objects at any given time and it's flexible? We're trying to put in results in Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Right. <laughs> okay. So, so what the way that we're kind of addressing that is you can enter that data 
and and you can then, like I said, upload a file, say linking to the PDF that might be in the literature, um, if it's a historic project or something. And I think that the the date that the um, research was done is also asked for in that form, and like who did the research. And and so there's ways that if you're working with the data after you've downloaded the Excel spreadsheet, you could maybe go through and sort of filter out like which decades, for example, you might be more inclined to believe <laughs> um, as they are versus perhaps uh, filter out certain things, like depending on what you're looking for. But even with, um, say, a, a historic project, say from the 1830s or something, may not might not have access to the real, raw results but perhaps some of the results that they came through with would be useful in some way. So yeah, data is squishy. Um, and I think that's kind of up to the analysis side of things to filter out. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so the maintenance costs are currently going to be um, taken on by the Penn State University, but there's not a cost to the user to participate, if that's your question. Yes, <laughs> it is, yes. And the development um, costs were already shouldered by the National Library of Medicine. Mm 